Oh, hello. Welcome to another video. Today, we're going to be adjusting our microphone. No, today, we're going to be talking about the Inquisition team that's just gone on pre-order today. And if you stay tuned to the end of the video, we're going to launch a new, the second ever channel hobby challenge as well. So stay, stay tuned for that right at the end. So, um, I'm sure you've seen all of the people who were... Uh, got early boxes, I've put out their reviews, I've watched three or four different channels reviews of this so far, and these are my my thoughts with images that I've sourced from uh, those other, other people's videos across the web, so that's why it's coming up so late in the day. Um, so the Inquisitorial Kill Team, um, they can take any, uh, any deck they want of secondaries, okay, so they've got every archetype, fine, good. You always have to take an Interrogator and a Tome Skull, and the interrogator himself has no options. And then what you're doing is you're essentially essentially picking um, from a list of nine operatives. You either pick ten to run pure inquisition. How can you pick ten operatives from a list of nine? You're allowed to double up on the gun servitors. Or you can select five operatives of your choice and mix in another imperial kill team. So, yeah, if you're doubling up on the gun servitors, you can't double up on any particular gun, so you can't take two plasma cannons, for example. Uh, I don't think I'll ever take the heavy bolted gun servitor, because the plasma cannon and the multi multi melter are, as you would imagine, rather good. And so in terms of special rules, it's this ancillary support. Now, let's be really clear how this works. This comes in two kind of halves. So first of all, they have various teams that they're allowed to draw from as their ancillary support has been well previewed on Warcom. Um, every um, instance of the faction keyword on their card is replaced with inquisitorial agents. So what that means is if you take comms, for example, your comms can quite happily give APL to everybody else on your team, whether they're originally from, say, the, 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 the Scions team, or whether they're from the Inquisitorial Agent side, the whole team is treated as one team for the purposes of that, but you lose your ploys, your equipment, and your sort of spec ops associated with your original faction, and you lose your kind of overarching faction ability like elite points or... Um, you know, the ability that Arbites have to shoot into combat, things like that, okay? So it says here, for example, a comms veteran operative in a veteran guardsman ancillary support would have its veteran guardsman keyword replaced in all instances on its data card with the inquisitorial agent, allowing it to select any friendly inquisitorial agent operative for its signal action. However, as there are no operatives that can issue a guardsman order, its relay order's ability would be ignored, and it would now be a valid operative for the mystic operative's divine guidance and divine protection actions. Okay? Um, and as an extra part of this, your roster is expanded from 20 to 30 so you can take a couple of different sets of ancillary support and you can basically swap out almost like an old compendium team you can swap out half of your kill team as the opponent and the scenario and the situation demands now there's a lot of a lot of depth and a lot of moving parts here and those of you who've been following this channel for a long time know these actually is exactly the kind of team that i generally hate to run because it's uh there's a lot of FOMO when you're running a team like this because there's a lot of well if I'm running this well, I'm not running that and if I'm running this well we're not running that so so bear with me as I try and give you my my take so I'm going to go through these at the end of the the main data sheets as well but these are your uh, six options for um, your ancillary support if that's the way that you want to go just a quick summary the Scions that you get in the box are basically outclassed by Kazakin in every way. Um, we'll explain exactly why later on, but that's there. A little bit worthless. Um, notice that this has been glossed over by a lot of people. Uh, choosing Navy or Vet Guard gets you six models, whereas Exactions Squad Kazakin's is of Silence and Scions are all five models. And generally speaking, gunners are limited. So your Kazakhan are only getting two gunners. Your Scions are only getting two gunners. Your Vet Guard are only getting two gunners. And that includes the Sniper as one of your gunner slots. Uh, your Breaches are only getting one gunner. Your Exaction Squad is getting a gunner and uh, two Shield Men. 
right? So it is more limited. Um, there are things that you can't take. You can't take the vet guard spotter is gone. The confidant veteran is gone. All the leaders are gone. So be careful with this and don't assume that you can take things that you can't in point of fact take, all right? So we're going to start with the interrogator and the tome skull. We've kind of talked about these guys because the interrogator's data sheet was revealed on, on Warhammer Community. The long and the short of it here is that the leader is not an action hero, but he is in fact a supporting piece. I think he's actually quite powerful, uh, and in other ways he's the worst leader in Kill Team. It depends on how you look at it. The consecrated tome ability that you choose has basically a defensive and an offensive aura. The um, sort of the offensive version of it, uh, each time a friendly inquisitorial agent operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack against an enemy operative within the circle of this operative, add one to the attack's characteristic of that friendly operative's weapon for that combat or shooting attack. There's also a defensive version. Each time an enemy operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack against a friendly inquisitorial agent operative within the circle of this operative, subtract one from the attack's characteristic of that enemy operative's weapon for that combat or shooting attack. So what this means in layman's terms is if you... Because you decide which one the man is going to carry and which one the skull is going to carry, right? But if you're carrying the um, the offensive book, then you need to be near people that your team wants to shoot. So if your team is shooting someone that you are within a circle of, then they get an extra attack dice, which on something like a plasma gun is really valuable. For the defensive one, you want to stand back near the things that you want to defend and everything within circle of you including you subtracts one from the attack's characteristic of enemy operative's weapon for the purpose of that shooting attack right um you can change the tome that, between the skull and the agent but you have to be within an inch of the each other to do that so it's kind of worthless the skull has fly. Uh, it does only have five wounds, a defense of two, a five up save, and it is only movement three circle. Um, it has the usual thing where it can only dash, fall back, normal move, or pass. Um, but it does have fly. I think the play is you put your tome skull on conceal and you try and move it forwards with the offensive book. Maybe it's a little bit suicidal. Maybe you get one or two buffed shooting attacks with it. Meanwhile, with your interrogator, you hang back. He's got that extended stock auto pistol, so he can plink off a few shots that aren't very good, but he can plink them off. Um, and more importantly, he can provide a good defensive buff to a bubble of things in your army. Maybe your gun servitors or some other long-range support that you've brought in from your ancillary... Um, Ancillary support guys, okay. Auto Savant. The Auto Savant's really very cool. Um, in combat, basically nothing, right? But look, Scrivener. Each subsequent time your opponent uses a strategic or tactical ploy, excluding command reroll during the battle, you gain 1 CP. So if you're playing against one of those teams that likes to use the same ploys over and over, other than command reroll, every time they do that, they're feeding you a CP, Okay which is really, really good. Uh, Chronicle is a narrative rule. It basically means that you can boost the number of experience points you gain, which I'm sure is useful, uh, but we're not going to cover narrative stuff here in depth. Um, irrefutable report, we've seen. It was it was shown across the Warhammer community, but it is quite interesting. So you select an objective marker. Now, this can be done at the start of the turn. You don't need to be anywhere near the objective marker to select it until this operative performs this action again. While this operative is within blue of that objective marker, it dominates it. A friendly operative that dominates an objective marker always controls it, regardless of any other rules or the APL of enemy operatives within the required distance. If an enemy operative would also dominate that objective marker, uh, control is determined as normal. This operative can only perform the action once per battle and cannot perform it while it is engagement range of enemy operatives. So first turn, you can just, you know, you, you if you want to, you can go, I'm going to dominate that middle objective, then you can send him off on his way. Um... You know, it's interesting because it is within range blue of the objective marker. Remember that the objective marker is the point at the center of the objective, you know, of the objective token, right? It's a single point. It's not an edge, a thing with an edge. 
Now, we're all used to using these little circles that have the range of uh, white from the center of the objective marker sort of shown on them, and then we kind of have gotten into the way of thinking of that whole circle as being the marker. So what you've got to remember is that there's just a slightly bigger token. It's an extra inch around it um, for, the, for, the, for the agent. It's range blue. Now, I'm wondering if on some map packs that are out there in use, whether this could mean that there might be an objective that's in the open, but the auto savant can actually capture it through a, from behind a wall, behind heavy cover, because he's got that extra inch as well. Um, that would be an interesting thing to play with and look for situations where you can kind of exploit that, where you can get onto an objective quite easily by virtue of the control range of the objective being larger for your for your model as well, as well as the, the fact that you trump other things on the objective, right? Uh, the Quest Keeper, so I like the Quest Keeper. Uh, it, it's very simple, it has an eviscerator, it hits people with the eviscerator. The eviscerator's got uh, the unrelenting rule, so when you are the attacker, you can reroll one of the attack dice, that's nice, okay. Uh, got a 5-up feel no pain type save, that's really good because we're uh, quite a squashy team, so it's good to have that 5-up feel no pain type save as well. Um, and then we have Irrepressible Purpose, so if you're incapacitated in combat, you can strike with one of your remaining attack dice before you're removed from the kill zone. I like that as well. Seems really solid. Yeah, the things in this team are quite weak. It reminds me of when I was trying to play Novitiates a little bit, but it's nice to have uh, that 5-up uh, feel no pain to try and make up for that. We talk about the Death World Veteran, so he's also really quite cool. Um... He can perform a charge action from a conceal order, and he kind of has just a scratch. So once per turning point when he's fighting in combat, in the resolve successful hit step of the combat, you can just ignore the damage inflicted on one from uh, from one normal hit, which isn't bad, right? He has a pole arm that's uh, you know four dice hit on threes, four five reap two, which is okay. And then he's got his funny little knife, which is uh, one attack hit on a two five seven lethal five plus, which is quite cool and interesting. Yeah, I like him as well. He's pretty solid. The Enlightener. So the Enlightener is another combat specialist. He's a little bit weirder. Okay. So he has the paired blades, which four dice hit on threes, three, five, balanced, rending, and then this cripple rule. So his rule cripple, when he fights in combat with this weapon, um, in the results of his step of the combat, if he strikes the crit, that operative is injured until the end of the battle, regardless of any rules that say it can't be injured. So that's quite a good debuff. He also has a rule called no escape, which basically means that when you try and perform a full back action, um, he rolls a dice, he can subtract one from the dice and add one if you're injured. And on a four up, you can't perform the action, but the action points are not refunded. What this rule effectively means is people aren't going to try and fall back from your Enlightener because they're not going to risk spending two AP uh, and not getting anything from it. I think if he's got seven wounds, though... Even if you've charged something with your Enlightener like a plasma gun, it's not that beyond the pale that he's going to kill you. You know, so it's 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 one of those things. It's a very very edge case. You you kind of want to charge him into things like, you know, plasma guns and things like that as a sort of um, a, a, not really a tar pit because he's fragile, but it's that sort of effect where you're just going to tie somebody up for a turn even if you don't kill them and then you kill them again in the, the second turning point. I'm a little bit less sold on the Enlightener, to be fair. Gun Servitor. So, first of all, he has 11 wounds and a 4-up save, which is great. He does only have one action point. Um, although, if he has a friend within blue, he gets plus one action point. Now, his gun choices, he can have a bog-standard heavy bolter, which is pointless. He can have a multi-melter, which is a melter with heavy, which is bad, but no range limitation. Or he can have a plasma cannon, with, uh, which is a plasma gun, but with blast, but also with heavy. Uh, so these are two of the most powerful weapons ever shown in Kill Team, right? Multi-melter and plasma cannon. Um, yeah, the whole 1 APL thing is fine, really, when you consider that he's heavy. So he's not ever doing a full move and then shooting his gun, right? So at best, he's doing a dash and a shoot or a move and a dash, right? So the lobotomized thing, as long as turn one, perhaps if you're going to have to have a turn one where he's not going to get to shoot because he's not in a useful position, so you get him to do the move and the dash, 
Uh, and then hopefully from turn two onwards he can get shots off. So the Lobotomize thing is slightly annoying, but it's not really the handicap you might first think it is. Uh, right. Hex Assist. I'm not... I'm not sure how useful the Hexist is. The Hexist is really funny. Um, so he turns off re-rolls for your opponents within red. So certainly against some teams, like Intercessors, that's quite, quite good. Uh, if, if your enemy opportunity is visible to him within red and it fights or makes a shooting attack, you just can't re-roll, which is fine, which is good. Um, and he can spend an action point to turn off a unique action or activity on somebody else's data card, which... Potentially is ridiculous, but I, I'm just trying to think of particular examples right this moment where I'm thinking, oh, that's, uh, you know, that's a really clutch ability that they wouldn't want to... Use. The trouble is he's got to get within red of them and he's got his shotgun, so it's one of those things where people are going to see you coming and they're going to dedicate something to killing you. Maybe that makes you a bit of a distraction piece um, and protecting some of the other pieces, but it's certainly an interesting model, one that you'd have to kind of get to grips with using... Um, this team is reminding me a lot of novitiates, and I don't, I don't know that that's a good thing. All right, in that they have definitely have models that definitely do things, but then they just five up save and seven wounds. You're going to have to play really carefully with them, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mystic. So the mystic's pretty cool. Uh, so it has the standard icon buff, right? And it also has two psychic powers. So it either essentially it either buffs one of your team um, that's within red, so that they can then turn a free miss into a hit, or if you hit into a crit, or it does the same thing for their defense dice. Right, really strong uh, buff. You do need to be within red of the target of the buff, but you can buff them and they can go off and do something else. That's pretty fine. Uh, quite like the Mystic Agent. There's things you could do with that that will make it really worthwhile, even if you're just buffing your plasma cannon. You know, if you really wanted to, you could do it that way. Stand at the back, castle up, buff that, or buff someone that's come in from your ancillary support, right? Uh, just beware of your allying and sisters of silence, because they are psychic abilities, so the sisters of silence will turn off your psychic abilities. And then the penal legionnaire. The penal legionnaire is the only one of these that I think is actually really bad. So he has a hand flamer and a chainsword, and then he... He can't be modified, and he's not affected by stun. And each time he fights in combat or makes shooting attack against enemy operative with fewer than its starting number of wounds, you can re-roll any or all of your attack dice, which is uh, which is great. But he only has a chainsword, which is it's okay. It's not awful. I think basically this is the worst of the Inquisitional agents. So you're only taking him if you decide to run pure Inquisition. So basically, consider this guy to be like a attacks for having to get him to take two servitors right the pistol here now the pistol here is the best miniature in the box and it may have the best rules in the box right i'm a big fan of the pistol here i think everyone is a big fan of the pistol here uh you know sometimes known as desperados these agents are skilled killers who've honed their talents in the crime ridden underbowels of hive worlds alongside the quick draw they've learned the value of the silent kill as well as, as well as the ostentatiously explosive. So you've got a scoped plasma pistol. It's a plasma pistol, and in addition, it has a long-range shot. There's like a slightly weedy plasma pistol. It's only 4-5. Um, but you can still do the normal plasma pistol stuff. You have a silenced auto pistol. Is the silenced auto pistol useful? No, probably not. But you, it's cool, and you can use it in the same turn as the scoped plasma pistol for 1 AP. And your ballistic skills never be modified. I mean... It, it's not the best miniature in all of Kill Team in terms of its rules, but they're not bad. And um, yeah, I just I think Pistol is just cool as, isn't it? Aren't they? You know, can't, is she he? I can't tell, but cool as, cool as. Right, and now we're on to the ancillary support. So um, we got the Sister Silence. So they're identical to the Compendium. These screenshots are actually from the Compendium, just to kind of labour the point. Um, now, you're adding in five bodies with three up save and eight wounds for a team that's otherwise struggling for survivability. So that's a really good thing. Um, I would always really go for the Vigilators, because they have power swords. So four dice hitting on threes, four, six lethal, five up. Five power swords is not bad. 
really funny against what I think. You always want to roster these if you have the models, and you will do if you've bought Ashes of Faith. If nothing else, so that when you're at a tournament and somebody's like, I've got Warp Coven, you can just really make their day worse by going, well, I'm going to ally in five Sisters of Silence into my Inquisition list. Sorry. Um, but maybe even against teams like Legionaries, because Legionaries, like the Legionary, um, the Psyche for Legionary always upsets me. So maybe you just want to send your Sisters of Silence rampaging. I mean, they do have to get near him. And really, the Librarian there for the Legionaries is more of a an Alpha Strike early turn, long range thing. So it's not really that useful. But even beyond that, having the Snipers, having the Snipers, sorry, having the Power Swords and the Power Armor, it's not bad. Like, you could do a lot worse. I think if you've bought Ashes of Faith, you know, it's a really solid build to add in the 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 the, the, the vigilators. Um, five flamers. We were saying this when the compendium was the game, right? Five flamers might be funny on Into the Dark, but uh, yeah, probably not. Probably not. Uh, funny is not the same thing as good. Tempestus Scions. So you've probably heard the screams, right? The Scions have been changed. These are not the compendium Scions. They're different in a number of ways. Some good, some bad. Um, the comms is the same as the Kazakin comms now, so the comms has been buffed, so he can do the comms action twice, uh, just like the, 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 the Scions can, uh, the, the Kazakin can, and the BS is now 4+, plus, just like the Kazakin, which is funny. Uh, you've got a Medic, which is just like the Kazakin Medic, okay, so they have a, previously Medic was like a piece of equipment for the Scions, and now they've got a proper Medic, so that's nice. Basically, they're Kazakin, um, with with fewer options. So, they're pointless. Um, it, they do have smaller bases. So, if you really value being on a 25 mil rather than a 28 mil and being able to use your barricades to create like little gaps that only your guys can fit through, that's something. And honestly, there's not... Like, if you've bought Ashes of Faith and you don't own a squad of Kazakin... And you're not going to a tournament. Like, there's not that much difference between these and Kazakin, to be fair. Um, there are things... We'll look at the Kazakin in a minute. There are things the Kazakin can add in that they can't. But, like, a comms... The comms is a really good model. It's the Kazakin comms. Everyone knows the Kazakin comms is the best comms in the game. I think a lot of the content creating people have talked about this team haven't noticed that the, the Scion comms has been buffed to be the same as the Kazakin comms. So, it's not, like, a big deal. Right? So you got the Kazakin comms, uh, you got the comms there, you take a plasma gun and a grenade launcher and a medic and a trooper. And that's not that's not bad. It's not bad. It's just it's slightly outclassed by the Kazakin. So I'm not gonna go through all the Kazakin data cards. I've got a faction rundown on the Kazakin. The only thing is you Kazakin, instead of taking a grenade launcher, you can take the Kazakin sharpshooter, which I might prefer, certainly on an open board. Um and I might take a recon trooper instead of the basic trooper, right? Which gets me a free a free dash at the start of the game. Um, you know, which isn't it isn't miles away from where the scions are, but there's not really a downside unless you count the slightly larger base size. You could also take a different thing instead of the sniper if you like the grenade launcher. If you like that flexibility, then you've they've the car skin still have that option. Um you could add in the demo instead of the recon trooper if you wanted. Like, the Kazakin demo is good. It's just you've already got a team that's so... The Inquisition half of your team is already really close range. I kind of feel like you want to add in... And I know I just said the Sisters of Silence for a good take. Maybe you just go off for mid, mid and close, but I like long-range shooting. Um... Which is why I love playing my Kazakin at the moment. So of course, I think adding Kazakin into the Inquisition is good. Because I really like the Kazakin. Um, but they are just sadly better than the Scions, apart from the base size thing. Vet Guard. So Vet Guard, you have six Vet Guard. And none of them are worthless. I have seen some people talking about how good the Confidant Veteran is. Um, because you can you can activate all the more. The Confidant's not in this list. So just bear that in mind. Uh, the spotter also is not an option for you, as well as the sergeant, right? So I'd take, much like the Kazakin, I'd take a plasma gun and a sniper. You can take a comms, although just be aware, the vet guard comms is just so much worse than the Kazakin or the silence comms. It's not infinite range, it's range red, and you need line of sight. 
Um, and then I'd probably go for the Medic and the Demo and the Hardened Veteran as my other three. Like, you're getting six models. Um, I think this team really benefits from a Medic. I think, you know, because your Inquisition guys are quite weedy. I think having a Medic to follow around key guys is really useful. So, I think whatever you're allying in, if you can take a Medic, you often want to take a Medic. The Vet Guard Demo is not a bad piece. Not as nice as the Kazakin Demo, but you are getting that sixth model uh and then the hardened veteran but you could take the zealot he can buff the you know, he can buff other things uh you know so you got that look for those look for those exploitable occasions where your um you know one half of your team can buff and add to the other half of your team in interesting ways so that got a good I, I think this may be because I'm not really good at kill team I still think the Kazakin are better than the vet guard as well because um of the comms the comms the it really does just come down to that comms and you know yeah the the vet guard have got an extra body it's very close it's very close i think you can argue it either way with these i think the only one that is, is definitely worse is is the scions we're looking at the breaches the breaches are really interesting the breaches can be really really killy um you know i think the breaches they don't necessarily bring different tools to the Inquisition team in that they also just bring a lot of really good close combat and short range shooting stuff. Um, but their stuff is also really good and you can kind of double down on what is you're already trying to do. So you can take a plasma gun, which is nice. Uh, you've got an axe jack, which is a quite a killy close combat guy. You can take an endurance. You know, he can protect some of the other things on your team, like your plasma cannons, servitor, potentially. You've got a grenadier with free grenades. That's really useful. Hatch cutter's really good in a combat monster, and he's open. He's useful on open world maps as well. And then you can take the surveyor. Uh, probably don't take his cat, because you'd have to drop something else. Take the surveyor, because he still has the comms ability, right? You can still add an extra APL around there. I think Navy Breaches definitely have play as well. Uh, like it's really difficult for me to there's there's so many options it's really difficult for me to assess all of them I think the navy breaches are up there like plus they get an extra model and unlike like Vegar get an extra model and you can kind of see why navy breaches getting an extra model just seems kind of funny because they they're not particularly weak but I digress I digress um exaction squad Exaction Squad, I, I don't even have Exaction Squad filed in my brain as to how you want to run just Exaction Squad, right? You can go a couple of ways. You could take a Castigator and a couple of Subductors uh, and a Grenade Launcher and a Marksman, and that's probably concentrated as much killing power into one little chunk as possible. Um, but I, I quite like taking a Vox. Uh, the Exaction Squad Vox needs line of sight, but it is at least infinite range. I think that's, that's the way around they went with that one. Uh, medics are really good. Um, the Malakator could be really good in a team with uh, a plasma cannon because the Malakator can fly forwards, get close to somebody who's on a conceal order, say, oh no, you're on engage order, and then if the plasma cannon servers all shoots them and they're like in a big cloud of people, um, yeah, that, that could be quite funny, potentially. Potentially. But it's a tyranny of choice. There's a lot here. I, I like Kazakin. Or Sisters of Silence. Those would be the two that I'm thinking of for like first first game, second game, just to, to see how they go. I do think the Navy Breaches will have something. Uh, I kind of want to run Pure Inquisition. I don't think Pure Inquisition is necessarily the best um, option. But I feel like the way to play this team is to run it as pure inquisition and see what it is that you feel that your team which of your specialists didn't really do anything and which ones what did you feel like you were lacking and then you can go and swap and get that stuff right so let's look at the equipment We've got a lot of equipment. So armor bodysuit two EP. Um, it means that your five up save Inquisition operative can each time shooting attack is made against operative in the roll defense dice step that shooting attack. You can claim one defense dice of four as a successful normal save. It's not worth two EP. If it was turns your five up save into a four up save for two EP, would you buy it? Probably. But when it's one dice in the throw, that just seems really mean. For three EP, you can gain a four up in von. Right, so 
I don't understand how they get to these numbers. Two EP to to one dice to be four up, but three EP is just a four up in one. I don't know. Refractor field is good. Um, obviously, you can only take one, uh, and it's who you feel deserves that protection for three EP if anybody does. The Servo Skull, I think, is mandatory. Uh, the Servo Skull is once per turning point, during its activation, you do a mission action for one less action point to a minimum of zero. Uh, maybe you put it on the pistol here. Pistol is going to be moving up to go and get in close range with that plasma pistol to shoot it on hot. going to be doing things. It's going to probably go past and near objectives. It's probably going to want to move through doors. It's possibly not going to die really early on, uh, unlike maybe some of the combat operatives. Master crafted auto pistol. I think if you have the points, you may as well buy one and stick it on your leader because then he's shooting with a bolter rather than with not a bolter. Right. Um, power knife. So your operatives, other than your auto savants and your mystic, can instead have a power knife, which is pretty good. It's three dice in on four, three, five. I'm not quite sure who you're giving this to, to be fair, because most of your specialists are maybe the pistol here, maybe. Most of your specialists are combat specialists outside the auto savant and the mystic. I suppose you could give it to the servitor. Uh, I don't know why you'd do that. Uh, and then you've got grenades. You've got frags, cracks, stuns, and smokes. I have a feeling like smoke grenades are really powerful, and my brain is too small to make them work properly. Yeah. Ploys. The ploys are really good, is the cliff notes for the ploys. Um, denounce. Well, they're all 1cp. I'm not going to keep saying 1cp. Is any ploy in the game not 1cp? Denounce. Select one enemy operative and roll 1d3 in the firefight phase of this turning point. That enemy operative is treated as having a group activation characteristic of 1 and cannot be activated or perform actions until it is the last enemy operative to be activated or a number of enemy operatives have been activated equal to the result of the d3. Whichever comes first, you can only use this strategic ploy once per battle. So this is really good for those turn 2 or turn 3 situations where you have a a tense standoff with your opponent and you know whoever goes first is going to kill the other guy, right? And then you can go, oh, well, they've won the first turn. Okay, well, I'm going to denounce that guy that's got an obvious bead on this guy of mine, right? So that I'm going to get a chance to do something before he does something. Really quite useful, I think. Uh, intense scrutiny. So... Until the end of the turning point, when determining line of sight for each friendly inquisitorial agent operative, enemy operatives within two circles are treated as having an engage order. Potentially ridiculously good. Right? It depends on your opponent's playing. Some people don't care, right? And they don't really sneak and cage, and they just go, me intercessor, me, me, me shoot you, you die now, and, and there's not a lot you can do about it, right? But against certain teams that like to kind of lurk around and play the cage in your game, yeah, this is quite funny. Uh, <laughs> quarry. Select one enemy operative to be the quarry at the end of the turning point. Each time friendly inquisitorial agent operative fights in combat or shooting attack against that enemy operative in the roll attack dice step of the shooting attack, you can reroll one of your attack dice. If the enemy operative is removed from the kill zone, you can select another to be the quarry at the end of the turning point. It's not a bad strategic ploy. I don't know how much CP you're going to have because I don't know how much CP you're going to generate off your auto savant, right? Um, so if you have the CP spare, maybe you could designate somebody that your quarry. But you do have other sources of buffs and things like that. Irrefutable jurisdiction. Select one objective marker until the end of the turning point. Each time a shooting attack is made against a friendly inquisitorial agent operative within two circle of the objective marker in the roll defense dice step of the shooting attack. You can re-roll one of your defense dice. This is pretty funny. If there's a big contested central objective marker with loads of fighting going on around it anyway, you just give yourself a massive defensive buff around that objective. Why not? Now, the tactical ploys. These first two tactical ploys are just wizard. Uh, embedded agent... Use this tactical ploy at the start of the scouting phase. Select one of the following. Select and reveal your scouting option after your opponent reveals theirs. If both players would do this, select and reveal as normal. So this means you can basically always have um, priority in turn one and always make your opponent go first. Always go second in, in, in turn one, right? And then in turn two, have a decent chance of going first when it really matters. Uh, 
really powerful for that reason. And you can throw two CP at it, right? Because you can have also, you know, you can do it twice because its other option is that you get a second scouting option that must be different to your original selection. Um, so that's good because your opponent will know you have this and they'll know that they'll be able to force you to maybe pick, you know, a barricade that you don't want for anything or something you clearly don't need. And then you can put another CP behind it to get something else that you... Uh, would prefer but you do apparently have to decide at the start to spend it to do it twice before you can see their scouting option and fully decide right absolute authority do you ever play blue in magic because it felt a lot like this absolute authority you spend your cp and then when when an, basically when an opponent uses a ploy excluding command reroll the ploy is not used the command point is refunded and they cannot use it again during this turning point. You cannot use this tactical ploy in the scouting step. This is ridiculous. It, there are certain teams like Novitiates where a lot of the... Think of the flamethrowers and the, the re-rolls on the sniper rifle. Like quite a lot of their killing power is tied to their specific ploys. You shut them down. There are other teams like Kazakin. Kazakin, I think one of Kazakin's main ploys that I use anyway is uh, the re-roll. Like they're not very... Obviously, a reposition at the start of the turn, but you can't use it. Uh, only you can use it against that, I suppose. But again, I just think it shuts down some teams a lot more than others. But really funny, really powerful. Uh, Relentless in pursuit, one CP. You use this tactical ploy after an enemy already forms a full back action. Select one friendly agent within the, the. Basically, it's the guy that you fell back from, and then they can perform an action, right? Um, they can shoot you or whatever else it is, which is nice to have if somebody's falling back from you. You've got an option there. Um, the Emperor's Will. Use this tactical deploy in a friendly Inquisitor agent operative activated until the end of the turning point. You can ignore any or modifiers to their characteristics. So again, if somebody's injured and you really need them to be your action hero, you can always just spend this CP to uh, let them act normally for a turn. Right, get onto an objective. Usually, usually getting on... Uh, Getting onto the objectives, right, with the, without that move modifier, is usually the important one. Okay. Tac ops. Oh, these are crap. Uh, seize for interrogation. I'm not even going to read it. It's one of these ones where you have somebody, and then you create a token, and then you've got to pick up the token, and then when you've picked up the token, you've got to subtract circle from your movement, like. Like the stupid slaves one the Drukari have. that Nobody's ever going to take that. No witnesses is table your opponent went 2vp. Like. How often do you table in kit? Not that often right? So. No. Uh, <laughs> investigate lead is, is potential. Though. Has potential. So reveal this tack up in the target. Reveal step of any turning points. Let one friendly operative to be your investigator. The second time you perform the investigate lead action. You score a vp. And at the end of the battle, if you uh, are still alive, you score a VP. So, not bad. Uh, you know, perform an action, perform an action twice. Uh, and this could be the guy that you give. We're going to, um, you give the servo skull to, right? So you can do this for zero AP. Perform uh, action on two different objectives and then survive the battle for two VP is not bad. So, if you're taking a faction attack up, investigate lead is the one to go for. But you've also got all of the other options in the, 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 the game that you can pick from as well. So, bear that in mind. Right, that's the end of the rundown. So, now into the hobby challenge. I said there was going to be a hobby challenge, and so there is going to be a hobby challenge. Uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity for the second. Uh, every hobby challenge is what I've written. I don't know why I've written that. Every hobby challenge. The second hobby challenge. Yeah. Inquisition is a very convertible team, right? Because Inquisitional warbands can look like whatever. They could be really like lunatics uh, uh, of the Imperial faith. They could be operating operators who operate operatically. They could be like locally recruited hive hive scum. They could just be some veteran, veteran guardsmen. They can be whatever you envisage them being right um i think even people like me that were looking enough to get the box are gonna have to convert at least half of the team because you know we're not getting a second box um whereas a lot of people are going to convert it entirely which i think is great 
So all the inquisitorial agents, just so we know, because just to make it clear to everybody who hasn't seen this online already, are on 25 millimeter bases, other than the servitor who's on a 32 mil, right? So to enter the challenge, what am I asking you to do? You're going to create a legal inquisitorial kill team. Okay, so this can be a pure Inquisition kill team, or it can be the Inquisition kill team with a single ancillary support squad of your choice, right? And then you're going to take the best picture you can and post it in the correct room on the Discord. Deadline, you've got ages. I don't need to make the video rounding this up until the 20th of August, so you've got loads of time to plan, prep, convert and paint because i know some people have this finished in a week and they'll post on their discord and go i'm done and some people will get them in just before the, the deadline like please respect the fact it's a really long deadline but people hobby at different speeds and i want to be as inclusive as as possible and on the spirit of being inclusive like i know a lot of people don't like to convert right um i probably won't be doing that much conversion for mine i can't enter but i will do one along with the rest of the channel um i'm going to use i i got the pre-order in so i'm going to use the models the stock models i'm going to do some conversions to get the ones that i'm missing and that's probably going to be about it and then i'm going to paint it right if you want to do really cool proxies and conversions as well that's also really awesome but as someone said to me you know uh, on the discord the other day some people want to do really awesome conversions other people just want to paint the really cool duelist in a red cloak like on the box art and those are both totally valid expressions of hobby um the entries will be featured in a video and a top three will be awarded judging will be done by myself mrs ti and, and zimbad uh, obviously um it's going to be the same kind of scale as last time right so there'll be a scale of one to ten for painting skill which is the main thing right and then there'll be five points for theme and five points for legibility so if you use basically the stock models then you know you're not going to score that highly on theme but you're going to score pretty highly on legibility and if you i've done a really cool conversion but it's not totally clear what each model might be then you, that might knock you down a bit on on legibility because with conversions legibility for your opponent is an important factor but by far and away the lion's share of the the sort of thought is, is is the painting and the best painted the best painted kill team will win uh really regard the other things as a potential tiebreaker more than anything else okay good good and now we're ready for the final thoughts so please uh let me know in the discord what cool combos i've totally missed because i have no idea with this team i'm not planning to main inquisition but i am going to build and paint them because i want to play through the campaign with mrs T table to impulse right um so i am going to have a go with them i just it's really i i don't like teams like this c cerebrally uh it's a lot of different moving parts and thoughts and i'm the kind of person that will bring all the models to the game in a tournament and then have massive analysis paralysis picking my team from my roster of 30 i quite like simpler teams but i am going to have a go with this one so please shout out good combos down in the bottom please also do shout out if you're going to be participating in the hobby challenge and if you want to participate in the hobby challenge do join the discord it is a requirement of entry okay uh if you were able to get your pre-orders in we haven't really talked about the pre-order i my perception is that the, the the boxes were a bit more still not as widely available as i would like right to be clear but a bit more widely available than gallo fall right so let me know there if i'm right off base and please subscribe uh like and all that and if you wanted to become a channel member you know that would be much appreciated as well i hope you enjoyed the video and i will see you again oh maybe tomorrow you know uh we we, we will see uh, uh certainly certainly tuesday but i would imagine before the hobby stream on tuesday i will see you again all right guys have a really good evening Bye bye bye